In this lecture, we're going to discuss hypertension in an obstetrics patient. And the major thing you have to do is differentiate between chronic transient hypertension, that is the hypertension that comes before 20 weeks, and the hypertension that sets in after 20 weeks. Because the, the hypertension that begins before 20 weeks is a chronic medical condition. The hypertension that begins after 20 weeks of gestation is likely to be preeclampsia or eclampsia. That is, fetal parts get released into the bloodstream leading to vasospasm and thrombosis, a medical emergency. So we're gonna compare all forms of hypertension in the obstetrics patient against one another. We're gonna use a table. It's gonna compare the disease, blood pressures, timing of onset, what's going on with the urinalysis, what's going on with symptoms, and what you need to do to treat. First, we're going to begin with transient hypertension. Because most OB patients are younger, they shouldn't have full-blown chronic hypertension. And it is possible that you have a patient who has one high blood pressure reading, nothing else. So in order to be diagnosed with hypertension, the blood pressure reading has to be greater than 140 over greater than 90. And remember, to be diagnosed with hypertension, you have to have two separate high blood pressure readings on two separate occasions. Because it is a medical disease, the timing is going to be a non-sustained elevation of blood pressure, non-sustained because it's transient, that occurs before 20 weeks gestation. There hasn't been enough time to cause any damage to the kidneys, so there's going to be nothing on your analysis, and being normal hypertension, the patient will feel nothing. The only thing you have to do for this patient is keep a log. See if she develops full hypertension. If you compare that now to chronic hypertension, this is what most medical doctors deal with all the time. Someone who comes in has an elevated blood pressure. That means their blood pressure is greater than 140 over 80. I'm sorry, greater than 140 over greater than 90. And they had hypertension before they got pregnant and they still have hypertension now. That is, they have a sustained blood pressure elevation that occurs before 20 weeks of gestation. Now, in a real hypertensive patient, over time they can develop hypertensive nephropathies and other problems in the body like myocardial infarctions. But for the sake of comparing chronic and transient hypertension against the eclampsia diseases, let's just assume she only has isolated hypertension, which means that the urinalysis will show nothing and being hypertension, she won't feel anything. The only difference between normal chronic hypertension as a medical disease and treating it in the obstetrics patient is that you have to use medications that are different than the normal patient. We talked about this in medical disease, OB lecture. Alpha-methyldopa, hydralazine, and metoprolol are all class C, but they don't hurt baby and they can be used to control mom's blood pressure. This is very important because if she has chronic hypertension and begins to develop preeclampsia, if she's not well controlled under medications, you won't know if the elevation in the blood pressure is preeclampsia or just worsening of her hypertension disease. And at this point, I want you to put a big line through the chart because above this line is chronic hypertension not associated with obstetric disease, and below this line marks the medical emergency of the range of diseases, including preeclampsia and eclampsia. So mild preeclampsia, actually all preeclampsia and eclampsia, is a product of placental contents being released. And as that happens, vasoconstriction occurs. The vasoconstriction causes hypertension and also causes thrombosis. Thrombosis causes clots. Mild pre-E, that is mild preeclampsia, is going to be defined by an elevation in the blood pressure, greater than 140 over greater than 90, that is sustained, but because it is 
the obstetric disease, it will occur after 20 weeks of gestation. Because it's only mild, the urinalysis is going to have only a little bit of protein, less than 300 milligrams per deciliter. And she won't have any of the alarm symptoms. What you do about mild pre-E is dependent on gestational age. Because right now, mild, mild pre-E, mom's not in danger. She's set up to be in a dangerous spot. But right now, the only risk is to baby. So if baby is at term, mag and deliver. And you're going to see magnesium as the treatment for all of these conditions. If ever you suspect preeclampsia or eclampsia, you're going to use magnesium. Mag and deliver if at term. If less than 36 weeks, well, now you have to weigh the risk benefit. So you're probably going to let baby develop. But if she shows any sign of clinical worsening, mag and deliver. And what are those clinical signs of worsening? Severe pre-E is going to see a worsening of all of the conditions. You're going to see a worsening of the blood pressure, greater than 160 or greater than 110. It is going to also be sustained after 20 weeks, which is the definition of our obstetrics disease. But now, rather than simple microproteinuria, you're going to have greater than 5 grams per deciliter of protein, full-on nephrotic syndrome. And the patient is going to have the alarm symptoms. We'll talk about alarm symptoms in a minute. She only needs to have one alarm symptom or blood pressure and protein elevations to be diagnosed with severe pre-E. Pre, severe pre At this point, it does not matter what's happening to baby. Baby doesn't matter. Mom is about to seize. Mom is about to die. So you have to get baby out. You're going to give her magnesium to prevent seizures, and you're going to deliver, often by C-section. You can induce with Pitocin, but mom is right around the corner from death so you're going to have to probably do a C-section to get baby out. Once baby is out, the eclampsia symptoms will stop. Now, if mom begins to seize and has not had a history of epilepsy, it does not matter what her blood pressure is, when the blood pressure started to go, to go up, what her urine shows. If she is seizing, she is eclamptic and she is actively dying, and so is baby. This is a no-brainer, mag and deliver. This will be, by C-section, usually a crash. And because it is tested against all these other diseases, I want to talk about HELP syndrome, as it presents just like eclampsia. HELP syndrome is hemolysis. elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. The treatment for HELP syndrome is mag and deliver, generally by C-section. So we never mentioned once hemolysis, elevated liver, or low platelets, so why are we talking about HELP syndrome relative to eclampsia, severe PE, and mild PE? Let's talk about some of the symptoms of these diseases and show how they will overlap. Let's talk about those alarm symptoms. First, you may be checking routine labs, and if you see hemoconcentration, especially in the presence of edema, that is a sign of third spacing. Remember, this patient is losing tons of protein through her urine. Protein holds your fluid in your blood vessels. So if all of the fluid that was in her blood ends up in her interstitium, all of a sudden it looks like she's got a higher hemoglobin. Remember, a normal hemoglobin for a pregnant female is 10, a is 30. If she goes back towards normal, 
then it's a sign of hemoconcentration, and especially in the setting of edema, it's a product of that nephrotic range proteinuria. She may have preeclampsia. Epigastric abdominal pain is often written off. Because after all, pregnant women often have GERD, which will present as an epigastric abdominal pain. But in HELP syndrome, where there's swelling of the liver, which is why you get some elevated liver enzymes, which is also true in preeclampsia and eclampsia because of that vasoconstriction and thrombosis, what you'll get is Gleason's capsule stretching. Do not write off epigastric or right upper quadrant abdominal pain as no big deal. It could be the sign of Gleason's capsule stretching and they will ha be having HELP syndrome or preeclampsia. Worse of all, if people begin to have headaches or vision changes, this is a sign of vasospasm, the fundamental pathology of preeclampsia. And so if you are suspecting either pre-E or HELP syndrome based on some of the overlapping symptoms, what you're going to do is go ahead and get some labs. You're going to get CBC, an LFT, and a UA. And based on the abnormalities here, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated liver enzymes, you have HELP syndrome. Hemoconcentration, elevated liver enzymes, and proteinuria, now you're worried about preeclampsia. And obviously, as we already discussed, if anyone is seizing, presume that they have full-on eclampsia. So in this lecture, we compared hypertensive disease and obstetrics patient. The thing you must be able to do is separate chronic hypertension, which is a medical disease that occurs before she gets pregnant. Pregnant women can be hypertensive and stay hypertensive through pregnancy versus the obstetrics complication of preeclampsia and eclampsia. If they develop elevated blood pressure after 20 weeks of gestation, you must assume they're preeclamptic and need closer monitoring always being ready to pull the trigger on magnesium to prevent seizures and emergent delivery to prevent eclampsia. That is obstetrical complications, hypertension, and eclampsia. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.